All right, welcome to another episode of Black Swan Revelations. My name is Shane, and in today's video, we're going to be talking a little bit about a Black Swan event. In fact, one of the biggest Black Swan events in the world that the world will ever know is about to happen. So I'm going to share that with you. In this video, if you're interested in this kind of thing, then feel free to stick around and feel free to leave a comment. So, before we get started, let me just adjust this camera. It's bugging me a little bit. There, that's a little better. All right. Before we get started, I wanted to just give you guys a bit of an update. Next week... I am going to be on a panel, and I'm just going to share my screen here so you can have a look. And that, and the name of the channel is called Uptime Community. So I am going to be on next week, February 6th. I believe it's at 6.30 Eastern. What I'll do is I'll also put the link inside this description as well so that you can actually save that for yourself and when you subscribe to their channel just click on the notification bell that way when we go live uh, on their channel you'll be notified as well so that's kind of cool um, my brother tom was on yesterday on the panel and it was called the lord has a plan for you so tom coat was on yesterday and because of obligations and stuff, I was not able to make it last night. So it was kind of interesting because it would have been cool to have us both on. Uh, but we have a prayer and fast uh, going on with our church right now. Uh, yesterday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So tonight is the close. Uh, we're doing a corporate fast within our church. So. I want to talk about the greatest black swan event of all time that could happen at any time. But I want to lay down a definition so that you understand a little bit about this channel. You understand a little bit more about what a black swan event is. And then I'm going to share with you my prediction. So what is a black swan event? So if you are curious to go into great detail, then just I would encourage you to read the book, The Black Swan, The Highly Improbable Event. Actually, what's the proper title? It's actually called The Impact of the Highly Improbable by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Fantastic book. I can't recommend this. I try to read this book at least once every six months. It's a fantastic book. So what is a black swan event so the first thing right out of the gate is it's a highly improbable event that has three criteria the first thing is it's unpredictable the second thing is it carries a massive impact and thirdly after the fact we concoct an explanation to make it appear less random and more predictable. So the question throughout the book is, why then do we not acknowledge the phenomenon of a black swan event until after they occur? So that theme keeps popping up throughout the book. So let's talk about what I believe is going to be one of the greatest black swan events events that is none other than the rapture itself it fits the criteria it's unpredictable jesus said no one will know the day or the hour it's highly impactful you remove all the christians from the church the body of christ remember we are his flesh we are his bones we are one with christ we are joint heirs with christ so before the great tribulation starts, before Jacob's trouble, before Daniel's 70th week, before the days of vengeance, 
we are removed, whether that's the day of, the day before, or the day after, we are removed at the beginning of the tribulation, the great tribulation, we come out of it. So why do we not acknowledge a black swan, a potential black swan event? Why, why does that always happen? And then why, after it happens, why do we always concoct some kind of an explanation as to, oh yeah, we saw that coming. For example, 9-11, I know exactly where I was. I was riding on my way to work and I was a little bit tardy, a little bit late. I think I got there just after nine o'clock or right around nine o'clock. And I believe when I showed up, everyone was watching the news and both buildings were on fire, both buildings. So I, I missed the first plane and the second plane, but I actually watched the first building go down. And I'm telling you, I thought it was the beginnings of World War III or it was the end of the world. That, like, this might sound strange, but I have an uncanny ability to be able to put myself back in that scenario and remember exactly what I was watching and how I thought. A lot of people aren't like that. And Nicholas... Uh, Nassim Talib proves that in his work. He says people do not act that way after the event. In fact, what happens is after 9-11, for example, everybody thought there was going to be another 9-11, a 9-12, a 9-13, a 9-14. They thought people were going to attack buildings every single day. So if you were in a high-rise building in, in the United States of America, you were a little bit nervous. And in Calgary, we have a bunch of high-rise buildings as well, though granted not as high as New York. But I tell you, even today, when you go up in a, an elevator, a glass elevator, you are scanning the horizon thinking, especially when you see a plane off in the distance, is this one of those planes? We're forever altered. And that's what a black swan event does. You don't operate the same way as you did the day before. So everyone was thinking that 9-11 was going to happen again. This is why security ramped up. The planes were actually sent to Canada for some strange reason. They made all the planes land in Canada not in the United States. So it's kind of funny, it jammed up our airports, but that was a crazy time. So again, what happened afterwards was the further you get away from 9-11, the more concoction of stories you get. You talk to anybody on the street today and they'll tell you, yeah, I saw it coming. I knew it was going to happen. Anybody, you just talk to them. They'll just tell you, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw it. I saw it happening. Okay, well, why didn't you tell anybody about it? Exactly. You didn't know. That's what. That's why they call it a black swan event. You can't look back. You can't read through history and then go, oh, yeah, I saw it coming. But what you can do, and this is usually what happens, is you see patterns that develop leading up to that event. And then you go, oh yeah, we should have seen it coming. That's usually what happens. Because what we have is, um, what do you call it? We got it, we call it hindsight bias. So once we see the event, afterwards we look backwards in time and we go, oh yeah, we should have saw all the dots, everything connects. So this is why I tie in the rapture of the church with one of the greatest black swan events in the history of mankind. Why? Because it's going to interrupt the world. No one's going to see it coming. And when it happens, it's a game changer. That's the that's part two of the criteria is it has to interrupt the world in such a way, it has to be so impactful, and it has to interrupt the world financially so that you don't go back 
uh, doing business as normal. That's the biggest thing. And then afterwards, people will be looking at Bibles like this if they if they exist, because maybe they get confiscated. Who knows? But they'll they'll read it and they'll go, "Oh man, we should have saw it coming." Because in First Thessalonians four, Paul's talking about this. He's like, that day, Jacob's trouble, the day of Christ cannot happen until there's a great falling away first, and then the son of perdition shows up and declares himself to be God, um, the abomination, desolation, all that. So he's saying that event can't happen. Like, that can't happen until a few things happen first. So the days of vengeance can't take place until this happens, because people are panicked as though the end of the world was coming. Like, imminent, imminent, the end of the world. But what is imminent is Jesus Christ's return. Why do you think he spent so much time in the gospel saying, watch, keep ready? He shared about the wheat and the tares. And I mentioned that in a previous video. So many people think the wicked are being removed. So you get people like other ministries, which I won't mention. I'll be a good boy today. That they will say, you want to go through the tribulation. You want to be beaten like a bride on 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 the day of the wedding or just the day before the wedding. You want to be beaten for seven years in order to prove yourself to the bridegroom. And it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous concept that God will strike himself twice. Moses tried it and was not able to enter into the promised land because he struck the rock twice. And we all know the rock was Christ. So because he did that, he did it in unbelief. And God said, you should have spoke to the rock. Instead, you struck it twice. A no-no. And because of that, he was not able to enter into the promised land. And anyone else that was in unbelief fell. Their carcasses fell over a period of 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because of unbelief. So, this is why I believe the rapture is one of the biggest black swan events. Again, you have once it happens, people are going to be fearful if they don't know what's going on, that they're going to be removed as well. And the Antichrist is going to picture is going to paint a picture of fear saying you don't want to be taken by these aliens they are, that's what happened some kind of an abduction so stay in your homes stay in your homes we will feed you we will protect you until we figure out what is going on there are people attacking churches right now and all kinds of stuff so we just want you to stay home if you're religious if you're a christian whatever like they'll just they'll just say stuff to put fear and to make you stay home. And I honestly believe that only the Christians will be raptured. And then those that are attending a church because of their spouse, because of their friend, and they might call themselves a Christian, but they don't believe. They've never believed. But the next day after we're gone, I believe that people will be like, wait a minute, my spouse is gone. My children are gone. So what happened? And they're going to be asking questions and they're going to go, they'll find their spouse's Bible and they're perhaps their clothes or perhaps they're slumped over, dead. And we leave this body behind and we go into our new heavenly body, which is prepared for us. Because we all know the second Adam is from heaven. The first Adam is earthy. It's from earth. We're in the image of the first Adam. But when you are saved, when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you believe that he died on the cross, he rose again on the third day, you are alive forevermore. You will never die. What does that mean, never die? Well, Jesus was talking to Martha about that. Martha's like, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha's like, I know, I know, I know. And, and he will rise again on the last day. And Jesus looks at her and says, Martha, I am the resurrection. That's me. I am that last day, basically. 
So if you believe in me, you will never die. Do you believe this? And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Do we believe in Jesus Christ? This body is going to disappear. It's going to dissolve and turn to dust. We know that. We know that. We can just see. We have funerals just about every day. So this, again, is why I say the, the rapture is the biggest black swan event. Again, because... People are going to try and explain it away. They're going to say, oh, it was because they didn't take the mark. These people died or they didn't take some kind of uh, an in injection, something, and they stayed away. So they got infected, they died, or they disappeared. Who knows what the reason is, but there's going to be a, a great amount of fear and they're going to need an answer from the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to have an answer. And think about it, there's going to be way more jobs available without Christians around bugging people and telling them to go to church, to get saved, to read their word, to read the Bible, all this kind of, you don't have us anymore around, and then you have all these homes that are vacant. So who do you think is going to want those homes? The people that are left behind. It's going to be a great time for them. I promise you, they will soon forget about us. I'm not talking about loved ones that are left behind. I'm talking about people that are selfish, that are greedy. If you think they're greedy today, what makes you think they're going to be less greedy after the rapture? And they see thousands and thousands of homes up for sale at discount prices. Man, all of a sudden, instead of, uh, instead of buying a $600,000 home Canadian... You can now buy a $300,000 home Canadian because there's so many homes on the market. There's so many vehicles that have been repoed because people aren't driving them because they're raptured. There's jobs available. I'm telling you, people will shut up and stop asking questions when you throw money at them and tell them to stay home. We'll get you a job. You'll get a vehicle. You'll get a home at a discount price, we'll take care of you for the first six months, don't leave your home because we gotta figure out what happened to these people. So there is some kind of an alien abduction and stuff and don't be surprised if you start seeing drones patrolling the streets just to flag people if they leave their homes. Going to be very difficult, difficult times. Right now it's easy to be a Christian, so easy. In the back, you could see, or is it up there, right there. I have like five, six copies of the King James Bible. I have one here. I have another one downstairs on my table. It's an end of verse Bible, single column Bible. And it's easy to be a Christian. Anyone that says, and especially in North America, that it's difficult to be a Christian, it's, it's not true. It's easy. Especially in Canada, you can go to church anywhere. Anytime. You can go seven days a week if you want. If you find a Bible study, a men's group, whatever it is, you can you can go throughout the city and spend your time in church. It's easy. Now, it won't be after the rapture. It's going to be very, very difficult. So what I also want to do is just chit-chat a little bit of how my channel came into being and why this all ties in again with uh, the a podcast or the panel that I'm going to be on next week with Uptime. This channel came about because of when Russia invaded Ukraine, I was like, this feels end time-ish. I was a Christian, but I wasn't reading the Bible. I would probably read Proverbs maybe once a year, a little bit here and there, a little bit of Acts, a little bit of the Gospels, and Genesis once in a while, but that's it for the past 30 years. That's that's kind of my reading pattern. And I would fall asleep all the time after 10, 15 minutes of reading. I would just go sleepy time. If I needed a good sleep at night, I'd flip over to Leviticus and lights out. So I have witnesses to this. All three of my kids knew I never read the Bible, and my wife never knew that I never read the Bible. So what she did sneakily last year, I believe it was last year, um, 
actually 2022. She, uh, in January, she said a quick prayer. She said, Lord, give my husband a hunger for your word. She didn't tell me. She didn't tell me about it. Then, Russia invades Ukraine. And I'm like, this feels end timeish. I should probably read my Bible. This would have happened maybe a month later. And so I cracked out my New Living Translation, opened it up, blew the dust off of it. And you could hear the pages because they were stuck together. That's how long it had been. So then I went to the book of Revelation. I'm like, this is probably a book that I should know. So I start reading it, read the whole book, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Too much symbols. Too many symbols going on here. So then I thought, you know what? Seems like a lot of uh, the church fathers really gravitated towards the book of Romans. So I'm going to read the book of Romans. And as I was about to do that, I noticed on my bookshelf that I had a King James Bible from 1989. That my, my, one of my good friends at my uh, that was my best man at the wedding, gave me a Bible, King James Bible. No references, no commentary, nothing, just Bible. So I open it up. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, if you had a lie detector in front of me, I would have passed with flying colors saying that I would never read the King James Bible. I would not do it. It's archaic uses old English words, all this kind of stuff. I'm not interested in these, thou's, this is all the stuff. So I started reading it, the book of Romans, in the King James Version. And I sat there and I read the entire book. It took me, because I'm a slow reader, it took me about uh, an hour and a half, 90 minutes to read through the book of Romans. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. The next day I decided to do it again read the entire 16 chapters of the book of Romans. Then I did it again the next day. And then I did it again the next day. I read the book of Romans every day for 30 days. And it, I got it down. I could probably read the book of Romans now in about 20 to 30 minutes. But, but over that course of 30 days, I really began to understand what Christ did for us on the cross. And it wasn't anything to do with me. It was everything to do with what Christ did. And I started to get a little snapshot of that. And then what happened is a little pilot light lit inside my heart, meaning I began to get a hunger for his word. And I attribute that to reading the book of Romans every day for 30 days. All of a sudden, the pilot light was lit. And now I was hungry for his word. So then I continued reading all the way to the end of Revelation, from 1 Corinthians to the end of Revelation. I went, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I decided to jump into the Old Testament. And I started reading Genesis. And I started plowing through. I read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all in a row. And it took me five months to read the entire Bible. And I, had never, I hadn't done that in like 30 years. Basically, almost after I first got saved slash got married, I was really plowing through the Bible. It took me, I think, again, like six months to get through the Bible but I don't remember anything that I read because I did it so fast. But this time, because it took me five minutes and I was hungry for his word, I began to notice that the Bible was actually starting to get a little bit smaller because something that I read or listened to Jesus saying in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, I would go, oh, he said this in Isaiah. So I thought that was kind of interesting that you can start connecting the dots because I read Isaiah a few months ago. So then the next month, it took me three months to read the entire Bible, two hours a day, every single day, seven days a week. And then the third time, it took me one month to read the Bible. And I did that like three times in a row. So I, I read in 2022, I read the Bible five times. 
last year I read the Bible six times in its entirety. And right now I'm almost done. I started January 7th, I believe. I'm almost done the New Testament. And I've been just taking my time. Like I can't tell you how many times I've read Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, all the way to the end of Philemon. Um reading the book of Hebrews. I try to go through the book of Revelation every single week. And now I'm reading through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then my plan is to jump into Isaiah because that helps me. I, I find going to Isaiah to the end of the Minor Prophets is easier than starting from Genesis and going to the end of Malachi. I have to divide it in half. So it's easier to do the heavy lifting first and then the last thing that I will do is I will go to Genesis to Song of Songs. That way, I'm very familiar with the first half of the Old Testament, less familiar with the last half, or I should say it's more heavy is what I should say. So, Because really, in the, in the last two years, I've read Isaiah 11 times. I've read Jeremiah 11 times, Lamentations, Ezekiel 11 times. I've read Revelation probably 30, 40, 50 times. Romans, can't tell you. Numerless. First, second Corinthians, same thing. Over and over and over again. And then obviously the rest of the, of the Old Testament 11 times. I love the book of Leviticus. It's one of my favorites. I just divide it up into three categories. Basically the church and the hospital and the bank. That's how I read Leviticus. I divide it into three phases. Everything to do with a church back then, if you will. The tabernacle is also, they call it a church. I, I believe is referred to as a church in, I think it's in Hebrews, but I'm not sure. But just meant an assembly. That's all. I'm not saying like the body of Christ was present. I'm just saying that the tabernacle was an assembly, a place where they could actually assemble together. And that would be almost like their their church, if you will, because anytime Moses wanted to teach them something, uh, the, the elders would gather together, Moses would tell them, and then they would teach the people as well how to live their lives, all this kind of stuff. And then you had, once they got into Canaan, how they were supposed to operate and live with each other with their neighbors they weren't supposed to move borders um, if they moved into someone's house aka a giant or someone that lived in canaan they had to scrub the walls had to make sure there was no mold all this kind of stuff if, if the mold kept coming back they had to bulldoze the whole place turn it to a ruin and then if they had clothing that had mold on it, they had to burn it or they'd have to wash it a few times. And then if the mold kept coming back, then they had to burn it. So if they had it on their skin, all of this was why I say it was like a church, a hospital. And then the last few chapters, it talks about how to make transactions with shekels according to how much, how many shekels are in um, the tabernacle how many shekels the priests actually store. So you can actually buy land. You can actually buy um, property and all this kind of stuff. And you, if you're selling your cow or your, your sheep, your goat, whatever, the priests would actually evaluate it. And then it was like a one-time evaluation. You couldn't come back and say, I want another appraisal. The priest would appraise it. And then that would be it. That's your price. And then they would give you so many shekels for that cow. And that would remain part of their herd. So you could always buy it back, but you had to buy it back with interest. And I believe it was 20% interest if you wanted to buy that back. Same thing with tithe. You can also sell your tithe as well. And then if you wanted to get it back, I believe you had to add a percentage to that as well. So it's just kind of interesting. The Jews were very familiar. Israel was very familiar with bartering. If they were too far away to bring their, their sheep, their sacrifice, they would go to a money changer in one town. Let's just say they were in uh, the tribe of Reuben on the other side of the Jordan, and it's too far for them to travel with a cow or with a bull or with a sheep. They would exchange it at the money changers. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it was worth 50 shekels, that cow. 
don't know what it is, but let's just say it's worth 50. By the time they got to Jerusalem to trade it in, there would be, there probably was some kind of an exchange rate. And perhaps that cow was now uh, bought at a price at 55 shekels or 60 shekels, or perhaps it was bought at 40. Who knows? Like they would say here, this cow is actually worth less because you brought it from that land. Who knows what? And we evaluated at 40, even though in the land of Reuben, they evaluated it at 50. And the idea was the valuation was supposed to be the same all over. You weren't supposed to manipulate things. So in Jesus' day, what people were doing was basically saying, you know, like if they bought a cow again using the tribe of Reuben story, and they bought a cow and they brought it all the way to Jerusalem at 50 shekels, then what the money changers would say is this is actually only worth 10 shekels or five shekels. And like, what do you mean? I paid 50. And now if I want a sheep that I could dedicate to get sacrificed, you're telling, or they might inflate it. They might say it's actually a hundred shekels now and you only have 50. They're like, how come it's more here in Jerusalem? Well, that is what it is. And Jesus got upset at the money changers and flipped it because they were making money off of people's sacrifices. They were their hard-earned money. They would they would cash in these animals in their hometown and bring the bag of of gold or silver, cash it in. They say, no, you need like three or four of those bags in order to buy a sheep from us. So that's what was upsetting Jesus. So, anyways. <laughs> I say all this stuff because this is what caused me to start reading the Bible over and over is my wife's prayer. She prayed for me to get a hunger and then I just kept reading and reading and reading. Now I could read and it feels like when I when I read the Bible, it feels like I'm watching movies now. I just love it. I love it and I've not missed a day of reading. I don't I don't book a certain time. I just read. I just read whenever I can. I read, I study, I read, I make notes, tons of notes. I make just notebooks and notebooks of notes. So I'm not just reading to get through the Bible, but coincidentally, when you read through the Bible with purpose, you get through it faster as well. So there you go. So that's that. And then I originally called this YouTube channel Black Swan Diary because I just wanted to document what was happening around us in case we were in a black swan event based on the book that I just told you about, the black swan. So that's how I came up with the idea for this channel. And then I switched it to black swan revelations because it seemed like every day that I was reading the Bible, I had a new insight, a new revelation as to what was going on in the Bible. So I switched it to black swan revelations. So again, I feel like we are on the cusp of being in a black swan event and we don't even know it. We don't even know it right now. So there you go. A little bit about me. Like I said, I'll put the description of uptime in of the uptime channel in the description, specifically uh, the panel that I'll be on next week. Again, it's February 6, 2000 at 24 so next week so if you're watching this video uh you might want to subscribe to their channel and join us and then just feel free to comment let me know if you're watching my my channels or my, watching my video it'd be nice to get a little bit of support from this channel over there and support their channel as well so there you go so hopefully you got something out of this. If you have, let me know in the comments. Feel free to subscribe. This channel's growing every single day. And uh, let me know where you are watching this video from. And also let me know if you've heard of Uptime Community Church. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.